Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Andy, and in this video we're going to revisit the consoleized Game Boy project and create a smaller, simpler, new and improved version. Let's get started. In an earlier video, I made this TV game console from an original 1989 Game Boy and the shell from a broken NES. Inside, there's lots of hand wiring and two Raspberry Pi Pico microcontrollers to handle the input and output. This is a great project to reuse old damaged hardware, and I was even able to add different color palettes which the Game Boy didn't have. But there are also lots of comments from viewers about improvements they'd like to see, such as a custom PCB, smaller form factor, and the ability to use real cartridges. Well, there was one member of the Element 14 community who did all of that, and more, and his name is Joe Ostrander. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. So you've made a new improved mini version of the Game Boy console, and I thought it might be fun to make one of these myself. Uh, but before we get into that, I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions about the design. Absolutely. Great. So uh, one of the biggest changes you made was to get it to run off of one Raspberry Pi Pico instead of two. And in the old design, um, I pretty much ran out of GPIO pins because I had VGA output and controller input, and it was just too much for one Pico. So I'm wondering how you were able to get it to run off of one microcontroller. Yeah, that was definitely the, the hurdle is the GPIO. Um, and the, uh, my first thought was because it was using such limited colors as it was, that we really wouldn't need that many colors. It was, I think it was using like 15 bits for colors. So um, sure. I figured we could get by with uh, switching to uh, two bits per color and freed up about nine GPIO there. Nice. Okay, so one of the other things I'm curious about is you designed your own custom PCB for this. And I noticed that you took just a few chips from the original Game Boy and transplanted them over to your custom board. Uh, rather than use the entire Game Boy motherboard like I did. And I'm just wondering what are the advantages of doing it that way? Um, well, first off, space is probably the biggest advantage. If you want to cram it into something small, kind of got to put it all on one board. The second thing is probably cost. Instead of using um, a fully functional motherboard from a Game Boy, you could probably get one that has got some problems, or you could even use... Um, the uh, chips from a Super Game Boy cartridge, and you can usually get those pretty cheap. Disadvantages, um, there's definitely a, a bit of skill involved in removing and reinstalling the SMD chips. It can be a breeze once you get the technique down, but it might be a little more effort than some people might want to put into it. So it looks like the code and the design files for the PCBs and everything are available for anyone who wants to build this, is that correct? Yep, I'll uh, push all my stuff up to the the repo and if you want you can push it into your repo or whatever. Great. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you for sharing all this and for your time as well. I really appreciate it. And um, I can't wait to build this and see how it plays. Well, I, I should be the one that says thanks. I mean, this uh, your original project gave me a lot of ideas for things to try and uh, learning a lot of different things. And I had a lot of, a lot of fun with it. Well, I agree. These projects are a lot of fun to work on. Thanks again, Joe. Thank you. Joe sent me a package with most of the things I need for this build. Let's see, we've got a Super Game Boy, nice. Some electronic components and some PCBs and other random hardware. Perfect. Now, just a quick note on the Super Game Boy. The reason we're using this is because it's got an actual Game Boy CPU inside without a lot of the components that we don't need. You could just as easily use an actual Game Boy, especially one with a broken screen, and that's what I did in the previous video. But for variety, we're gonna go the Super Game Boy route this time. Now I wanna test that this works, but this is the Super Famicom version, and I've got a North American console. Fortunately, it's easy to modify the console to accept both kinds of cartridges. A GameBit screwdriver gets us into the machine, and then we can remove this plastic cartridge guide. There's a couple of tabs in there that you can remove with some flush cutters, or whatever tools you've got handy. After you reassemble the console, the Super Game Boy should fit just fine and you can test it with a game. As I do this, the irony of dismantling a Super Game Boy cart for, you know, the parts to build a Game Boy console has just dawned on me. Of course, we won't need the Super Nintendo anymore when we're done, so... Alright, let's crack into the Super Game Boy. Again, this uses the GameBit style screws. 
On the left is the Super Game Boy PCB, and on the right is the new main board, or motherboard, I guess you could call it, that Joe designed. And we're gonna remove just three chips from the Super Game Boy board and install them in the new one, and those are the CPU, the video RAM, and the work RAM. I'm gonna start with the CPU, and we've got these three capacitors in the way, so now I'm gonna drive everyone crazy by twisting them off. There is a small risk of damaging traces here, but this board's just going into the parts bin when I'm done, and as you can see, nothing terrible happened. Now to be clear, I'm not recommending this practice. When removing SMD chips like this, I like to use low temperature solder. And this is the flux that came in my low temp solder kit. Now I'm gonna melt a bit on all the pins. The idea here is we wanna heat all the pins more or less simultaneously. This particular solder stays molten for a long time. And when the solder on all the pins is molten, the chip will move freely. I saw in another video that somebody used blue tack to lift the chip more easily. And it, oh boy, that did not work as planned. Yeah. No, that smells really bad. Let's clean this up and try again. All right, as you can see, I'm alternating between the different sides, trying to get them all heated at once, and uh, I'll use the tweezers to try and nudge it, and there we go. I am not an expert at this, and it's a bit messy, but it did work. Here's the cleaned up chip, and you wanna make sure that you've got the orientation correct and that you line up the pins perfectly. Normally, I use a flux pen, but I'm trying this syringe-based stuff here, and, well, I'm not really impressed. I'm also attempting the drag soldering technique, and apparently I need some practice. Anyway, don't be afraid of making mistakes. That's how you learn. Ooh, that was a good one. Of course, this is a lot harder to do on camera with the weird angles and stuff, but take your time, make sure there's no bridging between pins. I think that looks great. Now I'm removing the RAM chips. Same process as before, just alternating sides, heating everything as evenly as possible. The pins on these are larger and spaced out more, so they're a lot easier to work with. And now it's time to add the level shifter. I bought two of these for when I make a mistake and, you know, burn one up or something. I'm pre-tinning these pads for the crystal oscillator, but I don't think I'll do it this way next time. The solder sort of raises the component up so there's this gap. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem, but it's not ideal. I cleaned up the board with some isopropyl alcohol, and it's looking nice so far. Let's flip the board over and attach the cartridge header next. Again, we'll just add a bunch of flux and then solder everything in place. That looks good, I think. Are you an engineer, electronics hobbyist, or maker? Join the Element 14 community, where you can learn about new products and technologies, see cool projects, and connect directly with the people that make the products and engineers that use them. Join now! Let's step away from the soldering iron for a bit and take a look at the case we're going to use. This is actually a Raspberry Pi case, but Joe designed his PCBs to fit in here with a few simple modifications. The original consoleized Game Boy was built into a full-sized NES shell, which makes this the perfect upgrade. It has buttons, cutouts for HDMI and power, and even a functioning cartridge door. Inside we've got the hardware to connect a Raspberry Pi, but we don't need most of this, so let's get it out of the way. When I try to install the main board, there's some posts in the way that I need to remove, and there's some in the top half of the case that need to be trimmed too. Now, I will warn you that I accidentally cut away more than I needed, which means I won't be able to use one of the case screws, but it's not a big deal. In addition to removing material, we also need to 3D print an adapter to mount a VGA to HDMI converter. And here's the converter. We don't need the shell, so we don't need to be too careful when prying it open. We'll need to remove the audio and VGA ports, which are extremely stubborn. Then we'll screw the board into the 3D printed adapter like so. We need to trim a little bit more of the pie case for this to fit. And actually, let's separate this power board since we're going to use that and it needs to go under the video converter. There we go, fits perfectly. Next we want to move the power and reset buttons as well as the power LED over to Joe's board. We'll start with the LED in the plastic light pipe. Be careful not to apply too much heat. The buttons can be tricky, but if they come apart just carefully reassemble them and mount them on the new board. Solder everything in place. Clean up any flex residue and looks like this. 
The last board we need to assemble is for the NES controller. Make sure you apply enough solder for a good sturdy connection. Now I need to talk about a mistake that I made when ordering parts. So I'd never ordered SMD caps before and I didn't know about different SMD sizes. This board was designed for 0603 Imperial. Uh, for these two caps, I bought size 0201 Imperial, which as you might guess, are three times smaller. I was barely able to solder these and needless to say, I didn't try recording it. Just by chance, all the other components were the correct size and they were much easier to deal with. Finally, it's time to do the wiring and I'm not gonna show you all of that because it would make this video way too long, but I will say that my choice of wires here is, hmm, questionable. I used 22 gauge solid wire, which is very rigid for this purpose and it's kind of handy in a way, but also kind of annoying. You might want to go with a slightly thinner gauge stranded wire. It's your call. And the last thing we want to do is trim the case to fit the controller port and other parts. There's no trick to this other than to just be careful and take your time. I spent a lot of time filing to get the right shape and it's functional. Now, as you can see, the thick wire I used really had to be squeezed in there, but it does all fit and the end result is very tidy. I'm really impressed with this. Also, I'm sure there's all kinds of customizations you could do with, you know, different paint jobs and decals and all sorts of things. So I'm not going to go through all the changes in the code, but if you want to do that yourself, you can follow the link to the repository in the video description. But we do have to program the Pico to make the system work. What's great is you can just download the UF2 file and install it directly. Hold down the white button, and if you're using Windows, it'll recognize it as a mass storage device. Copy the UF2 and the rest happens automatically. Super easy. Okay, I didn't have time to paint it, but I did print a couple of stickers to make it resemble its bigger brother at least somewhat. And I just love that this has a working cartridge port. Let's check out some games. F1 Race is a good one for testing because it requires very accurate video timing to display correctly. It's also pretty fun, but it seems like the difficulty ramps up very quickly. This is Castlevania 2 and it's one of my favorites. Unfortunately, like many Game Boy titles, it uses a password system instead of saving games. At least there's no chance of battery leakage. Now to show off some of the software improvements I mentioned. So on the larger console, I actually replaced the reset button with a color button that lets you cycle through different color palettes. But Joe didn't do that. Instead, he programmed an on-screen display that you can access by holding select and pressing start. And there you can change the colors, the border color, choose various effects, and even reset the Game Boy. I love how this works. One thing I want to mention is that this is an active project, and in the time it took me to make this video, Joe's already made a number of improvements. The latest version supports wireless controllers, and the cartridge now inserts fully so that the door can close. And I wouldn't be surprised if more cool features are coming in the future. That's all we have for today. Have you ever built a project that you saw in Element 14 Presents? Let us know on the Element 14 community website, and we'll see you next time.